As Aaron mentioned, tonight's going to be less than two parts, and it's going to be on addictions. I'm going to go over some of the negative addictions and how we can overcome them. And then Robert's going to get up, and he's going to discuss the positive addictions, and namely being addicted to Christ. I'm going to start off, I want to define addictions, or what is an addiction. It's an abnormally strong craving, an ardent devotion to something, a habitual or compulsive involvement in an activity. Now, most addictions have a couple of things in common. One, most of them make you feel good. And another, once you start, it's much easier to continue in it than it is to stop. Which kind of explains some of the statistics that I found from the, uh, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. And these are all percentages within the U.S. population. 6% of people over the age of 12 use illegal drugs. 10% are considered heavy drinkers. It's more than two drinks a day. 12% smoke cigarettes daily. 6% smoke more than one pack a day. And these last two were the most shocking to me. 15% of people in the U.S. over the age of 12 use marijuana 300 or more days a year. And 35% over the age of 12, 20 or more days a year. Now, those statistics are pretty shocking. But there's one addiction that, that we all know of that is more destructive and prevalent than all the others combined. It affects 100% of the world's population at some point in their life. And if not handled, it ends in spiritual death and eternal separation from God. That's sin. In Romans 6.23, we see the wages of sin is death. In Galatians 5.21, we see that those who practice these sins will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, in 1 John 2.16 we see sin broken into three different categories. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And then in Galatians 5, we see the works of the flesh, which provides us with a little bit more comprehensive list of sins. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, Sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as with the addictions mentioned earlier, once we get involved in any one of these, it's much easier to just continue in it than it is to avoid it. And I think if, if we look at just a couple of them, I think we can, see, we can see that example. If we look at hatred, contentions, jealousies, selfish ambitions, dissensions, envy, they're all committed out of a lack of self-control. And how much easier it is to do what we want than it is to do God's will. Luckily for us, though, those who wish to do God's will have a way to overcome these addictions. And it's the same way that we, the addictions to drugs and alcohol can be overcome. You substitute the bad with something better. In Romans 12, 21, we see this. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, many who are addicted to, say, cigarettes use suckers or candy canes or gum to help overcome the urges to smoke. Because the simple act of occupying yourself with something else can often help you get past that. Now, for someone who wishes to overcome sin, they can, use, they can start by using the list we have in Galatians chapter 5. Verses 22 and 23. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And when you start to feel the hatred and the wrath boiling up inside of you, remove yourself from the situation. Stop and pray to God. Have some verses memorized in the back of your mind that you can quickly reference to calm yourself down. And then once you have yourself under control, you can go back to the situation with a calmer mindset and not lose control. Or when you start to feel jealous or envious of what others have. You know, when, you, when you look at a new car that somebody just bought, you start to think, you know, I really wish I could have one of those. You know, that's the car that I've always wanted. I would do anything for that. You need to stop and thank God for what you do have. Because as was mentioned last Sunday morning in services, what we have in America, the poorest of us is considered rich in just about any other country in the world. So when you feel the jealousy and the envy starting to build, it's just like the song we sing. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. As with any addiction, though, there are often relapses. Once we become a Christian, we don't just stop sinning altogether. We'll be tempted, and we'll succumb to those temptations. We strive to live without sin, but no, none of us are perfect. But just like an alcoholic, though, we have a support group. We can go to them for strength, for comfort, for prayers. First, we have our brothers and sisters in Christ. Galatians 6.2 says, Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. They can pray with us, can pray for us, they can give us advice. Because more than likely, one of our brothers or sisters in Christ has been in our same shoes before. They've been through the same thing that we're going through. And they can help. Our biggest supporter of all is God. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And He will provide a way if we'll only stop and look for it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 See, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. And we can also look to Christ for, for an example. He can sympathize with us. Because he's been tempted just like we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4.15. In Hebrews 4.16, see that Christ is the only way that we can find the grace and the mercy that we so dearly need. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, to recap what we've gone over real quick, sin can be addicting. It's just like any drug out in the world today. Only this one, if we don't handle it, is going to separate us for God, from God for eternity. We'll end up with an eternity of pain and punishment in the lake of fire. But just like drugs and alcohol, Sin can be overcome by doing good, praying to God, and striving to always keep control of ourselves. And when we fall back into that same pattern, the same routine of sin, we have a support group. And they're there to encourage us, to comfort us, to strengthen us, to pray for us. But we have to keep these things in the forefront of our mind. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verse 12. 
I'll leave with this verse and one last thought. All right, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. If we don't keep these things in the forefront of our minds and remember that we have a support group and that we are to strive to keep control of ourselves and to keep from sinning, when we start, when we get too prideful and too arrogant to the point that we think that we are strong enough to handle sin on our own, that's when we fall. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That is found in Matthew 5, verses 6. Not all addictions are a negative, as Jonathan had spoken of. We are to be fully addicted to Christ, our Savior. The Bible says in Revelation 2, verse 10, Do not fear any of those things which you are to about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulations ten days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. In life, we're going to have our temptations, but we must overcome and have a lifelong addiction to Christ, and that we must devote ourselves solely to Christ, being Christians and Christ-like. However, we can't be like Christ if we aren't like Christ. So how do we show our love and our addictions to Christ? If you will look in Romans 10, verses 2 through 3, the Bible reads, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So what does all that mean? You can also look in the Old Testament, Hosea 4, verse 6. The Bible says that, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will also reject you from being priests for me. Because you have forgotten the law of your God, I would also forget your children. Simply put, knowledge and salvation go hand to hand. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study to learn how to be addicted to Christ. We are shown the examples of good addictions in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. <clears throat> now, how do we actually know that we are addicted to Christ? In Second Thessalonians 2, Um, 11 through 12. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusions that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned, who do not believe the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. My friends, it is knowledge. The how to make it to heaven guide is right here. Our Bibles. Remember Hosea 4, 6. It's nothing enlightenment. It's just knowledge. In essence, we are destroyed for our lack of commitment or our addictions to Christ, which will lead to knowledge, fear, and the wisdom, which will lead to a life of love, honesty, faith, and obedience unto death, the life of Christ. Now back to the original question. How do we know? If we turn to 1 Timothy 2, 3-4, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. Um, And then also go to uh, Matthew 7, 21, please. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father... It, it goes all back to knowledge and, and how we know. Everything that we need to know is going to be presented in the Bible, how we should live. Um, we, must be, we must obey Him. Hebrews 5, verses 8 through 9, Though He was a son, yet He learned obedience by the things which He suffered. And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all obey Him. So what did He say? Well, I'll sum it up. 
in John 3, verses 1 through 7. There was a name, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these things, do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. There it is. But do you believe in him enough to obey? Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And if we don't, um, in Second Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, And to give you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the knowledge of God doesn't come from simply the way you feel or calling God into your heart by saying the quote-unquote sinner's prayer. I've heard that said on TV, and it, it hurts me so much because that's completely opposite what the Bible says. Salvation and knowledge and the things that we must do go hand in hand. <clears throat> in 1 Peter three twenty one, there is an antitype which now saves us, and that is baptism. Not the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrections of Jesus Christ. That's the way that we are going to start our path towards salvation to make it to heaven. The same God that says, love your neighbor, said be baptized. The same God that says, do not steal, said be baptized. The same God that created the heavens and the earth and commanded us to obey him, said to be baptized. But that is merely the beginning point. After we have repented and denied ourselves, which those examples are found in Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And then also in Matthew 16, verse 24, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Of course, we have to, in doing that, then we, we do confess the name of Jesus Christ being that He is indeed the Son of God, and be baptized. But we must continue in that knowledge to study, to stay addicted, to obtain the wisdom and the godly fear. In Proverbs 1, verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And then in Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He had the faith to believe, which gave him the fear. Fear, knowledge, wisdom. That's what's going to help us get to heaven. But ultimately, why? Turn with me to Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection." Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sins. The knowledge to be like Christ, pure and innocent. Did you just hear that? It's a little baby right there. It's just a beautiful noise. Go to Matthew chapter 18, verses 3. <clears throat> and Jesus said, Assuredly I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little, as little children, 
you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. We have to humble and submit ourselves to the point like some great examples of a little child. They are completely dependent upon their parents. And we have to be completely addicted and dependent on Christ if we want to have that true hope of of going to heaven. It is not faith only. I stated in James 2, verse 24, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. But it's not by works only. Um, it is not bapti- it's not baptism only. Because we can fall. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it says, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened to have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify themselves again for themselves, the Son of God, and put Him to an open shame. Once you are baptized, it does not mean that's it. That's merely the starting point. You have to live, as we saw in Revelations, completely addicted to life until you take your final breath. <clears throat> um, a continued addicting life to Christ, repenting, forgiving, and getting better. We're going to fall, but we have to strive to get better because sin ultimately will separate us from death. In Romans six twenty three, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ, or God was so loving that He gave His only begotten Son. And I've mentioned that before today, but I, I think we say it so often that sometimes we might truly forget that a man that we did not know died for us before we were born. He showed the ultimate proof, the ultimate love that you can ever have, and that is to die. That is to lay down your life for a friend. And we need to remember that. And because He has created us, the least we can do is serve Him the way He has commanded us. So my question to you is, are you addicted to Christ? And I mentioned that today that there were about 70 people in attendance this morning, which is a very good crowd, but only seven people made it to the 2 p.m. service this afternoon. And I'm not trying to point anyone out. I'm just making a point. In James chapter 1, verse 27 Paul reads that pure and undefiled religion before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and keep oneself unspotted from the world. <clears throat> James 4.14 Whereas, do you not know what will happen tomorrow? For what, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time, then vanishes away. What are we doing with the opportunities that we have that God gives us. We're not going to be here. We're only on this planet for just a moment. Just in the grand scheme of things, we're only here for just, just a moment, like a vapor in the wind. And Luke 10, verse 27, says, You shall love the Lord, Yahweh, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Love is extremely crucial and is a crucial part to our addictions to Christ. Don't let life get in the way of your addictions to Christ. <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. I mean, we know that Mary had had, in this case, she had put Christ first. And we can't let the, the tedious things of life distract us from what we completely have to be addicted to, and that is Christ. So ask yourself, once again, are you truly addicted to Christ? Do you have sin in your life? Then repent. Just turn away. Is Christ truly first in your life? Ask yourself, is He? Or do you need to be baptized? We realize, if you understand this message, you realize that it is our true way to get to heaven. We have to go through Christ. Repent now. 
The Bible says in Luke chapter 15, verse 7, I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Repentance is that important, that special, but is that necessary? So stay addicted to Christ. Whatever you need, please do so now as we stand together and sing.